disorders might look different across the lifespan. So for example, depression, which we'll talk about today, has symptoms in adolescence that look quite a bit different in some ways than the symptoms we see in adulthood. And so it can be difficult to diagnose depression in adolescence because of that. Another problem in particular with adolescent depression is the same symptoms that help mark uh, depression in adolescence or some of the same stereotypes we have about adolescence in general. So that's another reason why depression can go undiagnosed in adolescence, for example. So that's one problem uh, with the DSM, with the way that we categorize and classify disorder now. I think it's something that uh, clinical psychologists are talking about changing a bit in future iterations of the DSM. Perhaps maybe it might be better to categorize them in a different way, like etiology um, or the different co underlying causes of disorders. A second major problem with the DSM and the, with, with the way that we classify disorders now is in the focus on labeling disorder can sometimes stigmatize that disorder. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why it's hard to get treated for disorder now, right? The way that our health care system is set up, it can be really, really costly to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist to begin with. Um, it can be really, really difficult to find someone in your network to pay for it or make an appointment with them. I, I assume particularly now might be an especially difficult time when everything is increasingly moving to digital interactions uh, because of COVID-19. So it's difficult already to seek treatment. Um, and I think when we stigmatize disorder by calling it a name and calling a person by that disorder, like calling a person an anorexic or calling a person an autistic person, it stigmatizes that disorder. And I think it makes it more difficult for people to get help because they're afraid of the judgment. And we'll talk about this particularly with respect to depression, but depression is a particularly tricky one because we have the same name for clinical disorder as the word we use to describe when people are just generally sad. And so I think that makes it difficult for people to take disorders like depression, for example, seriously, because I think people think, well, yeah, just if you're sad, just make yourself happy. Just stop thinking about it. Just, you know, make yourself do things that are going to make you happy and snap out of it. But as we'll talk about when we talk about depression, for example, in more detail in a bit, it's almost impossible to do things that are important for your daily life or even things that you like when you're depressed uh, because it really is it's not just feeling sad it's not just those psychological symptoms but it's real biological symptoms as well that make it really really hard to go about your daily life so when we add stigma to these disorders it makes it all the more hard for people to get help to begin with and it's already so difficult um, in, in so many ways, for so many reasons, uh, to seek help uh, that we need to begin with. And, and one thing that I said before uh, that's important to remember, uh, as students here at Purdue, you do have access for free to the Counseling Center at Purdue. Um, so it is really important to uh, try to take advantage of that. And I just want to make you aware of it. They have so many resources, not just counseling, but uh, testing. They have online testing as well. They have classes on, I think, meditation that they uh, offer too and other coping strategies and things of that nature. So I just want you to be aware of it in general because it is a really good, um, it's a really good uh, resource that's available to you as students. Okay, so now we're going to start talking about separate disorders. And we're going to talk about them in clusters, like the clusters that they're separated into in the DSM. And the first cluster of disorders that we're going to talk about in more detail are what are called the neurodevelopmental disorders. So we'll talk about two of those in particular. We'll talk about autism spectrum disorder, and we'll also talk about attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. First, We'll talk about autism spectrum disorder. 
autism spectrum disorder is tricky for some major reasons. Um, the major reason why it can be tricky is because it is a spectrum. Uh, in particular, the DSM, the latest DSM, the DSM-5, has changed the way that it categorizes autism spectrum disorder. So it used to have autism and it used to have um, other sort of related disorders like um, uh, Asperger's syndrome. Now uh, they're all kind of collapsed into this spectrum. And it truly is a spectrum. It's a wide range of symptoms, which we'll talk about momentarily, skills too, and levels of disability. So one thing that you hear a lot when you hear people from the autism spectrum disorder community talk about autism is they'll say, if you know a person with autism, you know a person with autism. And what they, what they mean by that is just knowing one person with autism spectrum disorder does not necessarily tell you anything about the next person you would meet or the next person you would try to treat with autism spectrum disorder because again, it is on a spectrum. So what this means is that uh, the way that you go about treating autism spectrum disorder might look different from person to person, again, based on the symptoms that they're experiencing, based on the skills that they have, and based on the levels of disability that they're dealing with. And so let's first talk about the symptoms that are associated with autism spectrum disorder. And again, I just want to note that not everyone with autism spectrum disorder is going to have this particular uh, symptom. Again, it differs from person to person. But the symptoms are lumped into two categories. Uh, the first is what we will call social problems. And then the second are repetitive behaviors. So the social problem symptoms uh, that are common in autism spectrum disorder are things like generally having a general difficulty with communicating with others, interacting with others. So one common symptom, one well-known symptom is eye contact. And if you ever spend time in early childhood environments like I have, um, because I study, as you know, early childhood development, you, you often see uh, early childhood educators or even parents uh, trying to force eye contact with young children who don't want to do it for whatever reason. And the research on eye contact in autism spectrum disorder is that generally forcing people to make eye contact when it's already uncomfortable for them uh, to, to force them to do it when they're communicating with other people generally uh, makes that communication even more difficult uh, for them. So it is generally recommended to not try to force a person with autism spectrum disorder who finds eye contact really uncomfortable. It's generally not advised to force a person to do that. Again, because it just makes it even more difficult for them to focus on communication to begin with if if eye contact is so distressful for them in the first place. Um, another common symptom might be having a hard time with back and forth conversation, and that might be for different reasons. Um, they might have a difficulty um, giving other people a chance to respond because perhaps they are so engrossed in whatever the topic of conversation is. Sometimes, um, a person with autism spectrum might have difficulty matching their facial expressions and their body language and their gestures with what they're talking about. So conveying the emotion that your conversation partner expects uh, might be really difficult. And this is because one key deficit, particularly for children with autism spectrum disorder is often theory of mind. So we talked about theory of mind before as this understanding uh, that other people have a different inner space than you, that other people might have different feelings, different understandings, and different kind of goals and beliefs than you do. And so for children with autism spectrum disorder, we talked about this when we talked about theory of mind, they are more likely to fail that false belief test that we talked about as a way of identifying children's theory of mind skill. 
So because children with autism spectrum disorder just might have a harder time with theory of mind in general, it might be really, really hard for them compared to other children to predict what other people are thinking, what other people expect from them in terms of how they respond to them in conversation or how engrossed they are in this conversation. So that can make back and forth conversation really, really difficult. They also might be more likely to respond in an, in, in an unusual way, convey a different emotion than what would be typical. They might do something that's called echolalia, in which they repeat words or phrases that they hear over and over again. They might speak in an unusual tone of voice, like more sing-songy than typical or more like flat affect, like more robotic than usual. They might have a hard time kind of understanding another person's point of view also, which might also make back and forth conversation difficult. Um, they might really talk to you at length about something that the other person just doesn't care about, but that they find really interesting. So those are the potential social problems that uh, we can see sometimes in, in people with autism spectrum disorder. There are also another range of symptoms that are that fit into what are called the repetitive behaviors. So this might be when a person with autism spectrum disorder repeats certain actions over and over again or having weird behaviors or they might be completely engrossed in a particular topic or a particular activity kind of to the exclusion of other things. So those are repetitive behaviors. Another common symptom uh, that is often seen in children with uh, autism spectrum disorder are things like uh, sensory processing disorder. So this disorder can be comorbid with sensory processing disorder, where it's really um, where that person might be really sensitive to things like light or noise or even texture. Uh, so certain fabrics might be very, very uncomfortable for someone with sensory processing order to interact with. Like perhaps they just really hate felt or like something that would seem like a normal amount of light might be really bothersome and might be too much and overstimulating or something that might be like most of us might consider a normal amount of noise, like conversation in the background might be overwhelming to someone with sensory processing disorder. Sometimes people with sensory processing disorder might have a really hard time with being touched and it might be really uncomfortable for them. So that's something to just always think about um, whenever you think about touching someone in general is touch might be really, really uh, uncomfortable to people for a lot of reasons, not just sensory processing disorder. So it's always important to try to avoid, and especially now in the time of COVID-19, uh, it's it's just a general good idea to avoid touching people unless you know for sure you know they're comfortable with it and you know want you to touch them for any reason like shaking their hand or um, you know hugging or, or things like that um, another general set of symptoms that can be common in autism spectrum disorder are things like sleep problems uh, digestion problems and irritability more general so generally, in assessing autism spectrum disorder and um, diagnosing it, it might involve different things like uh, testing cognition, testing age-appropriate skills, and language ability as well. 